So then we can get uh, started with the webinar and we can move on to the next slide, which will give you a brief overview of today's presentation. You will see that we will first focus on filing and timing issues, then communication, then procedural expert aspects, then grounds and other substantive matters to end with the decision. And Delia and Mara will tackle these subjects from an EU uh, perspective with respect to several EU member states, and they've received input from ECTA's harmonization committee in that respect so that they can address several member states. But Lennox and I, we will stick to the Benelux and give a perspective from the Benelux. So then we can turn to the next slide and deal with the first issues of filing and timing. And for that, I will pass on to Delia, who will uh, discuss the next slide on the deadline for filing specifically in opposition. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Karina, for the nice presentation and for giving me the floor. So the aim of the directive uh, was to bring the national trademark uh, system more consistent with the European Union trademark system where there is a pre-registration opposition system, but there are countries where opposition can be filed after registration of a trademark, such as jurisdiction is the country from where I am from, Romania, but Romania is not the only jurisdiction where a post-registration opposition uh, can be filed. Austria, Finland, Germany, Latvia, and Sweden have also this system, while others like um, in Benelux, Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Estonia, France, Greece, Hungary, Ireland, Italy, Lithuania, Portugal, Slovakia, Slovenia, Malta, Poland, Spain, um, there is a pre-registration opposition. So the deadlines are calculated depending if it's... So this deadline uh, for filing an opposition two months or uh, three months is calculated depending if we talk about pre-registration or post-registration. So they are, um, the opposition periods uh, are either of two or three months uh, from uh, publication, either of the trademark application of, or the decision for registration of that trademark and are different from um, country to country. So the countries where the, they have a two month opposition deadline are um, Romania, France, Portugal, also in Benelux, the territory covered by uh, Benelux office, uh, Finland, Spain, and uh, in other countries like um, uh, Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, uh, Greece, uh, Germany, Hungary, there is a three months um, uh, opposition deadline. There are some exceptions. In uh, Italy and uh, Austria, the three months uh, deadline is calculated differently. Um, and this difference is made if it's um, about between national trademarks and international trademark registration. So the three months um, uh, deadline is calculated from the date of publication of the application in the Italian, respectively Austrian official bulletin, if we talk about national trademarks, or three months from the first day of the month following the month in which the international trademark was published in the bulletin of the WIPO, if we talk about international trademarks. In Ireland, there is a specific situation which should be retained for anyone who has an interest in Ireland, Namely that the three months is um, calculated minus one day from the date of publication, which means that the opposition cannot be filed in the last day when the three month uh, deadline is um, met. In Malta, the deadline is uh, 90 running days following publication of the um, trademark application. In my jurisdiction in uh, Romania, uh, the opposition deadline cannot be extendable, and this is the same in Italy. And with this, I'm giving the floor to Mara. So we're still in the filing and timing section, but we are um, talking of whether formal action is possible. Formal action means like a short opposition notice without all the grounds up front. And of course, it does, uh, it is part of the filing and timing. It has a bearing on timing because obviously, if my position is um, expiring the, the deadline today or tomorrow, it is obviously easier to file a last minute opposition if we know that uh, the full brief is not necessary upfront. Uh, what we call here a formal checklist will apply to all countries, except that in uh, some, as uh, you can read, uh, the full briefs are also due. And uh, <clears throat> those countries where the brief is not due upfront and can be um, filed at a later stage, um, still 
need to be looked into because the proceeding does not always work exactly like we are used to with the EU IPO. For example, in France, uh, the brief is due one month after the uh, notice of opposition and the proceedings will not start at all if the brief is not filed. In uh, Romania, um, the proceeding is more similar to the EU IPO in the sense that uh, you can file a short uh, position form, but then the office uh, will provide the deadline for the full brief only once the cooling off period has expired without uh, the parties finding an agreement. Italy also has a mixed system. I would like to add that uh, we should not uh, mix up uh, the idea of grounds with that of arguments, because grounds generally, even though there are exceptions, are due upfront. So we need to um, know whether we are going to rely on a risk of confusion, on uh, well-known uh, marks and uh, dilution or other grounds, and which are the earlier grounds, uh, the earlier rights that we want to invoke. Um, the arguments are the full arguments uh, explaining, um, explaining the reasons for our opposition. Normally, for cancellation actions, since there are no compelling deadlines like uh, there are with oppositions, argumentative briefs need to be filed up front, but this is not always the case. So I will give the floor to Karina, who will specifically talk about the situation in Benelux. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. In Benelux, um, we do not need to substantiate up front, but you made this good distinction distinction between the arguments and also the grounds. In the Benelux, it should also be noted that in opposition proceedings, you do not even um, have to specify uh, the grounds up front, which is, of course, different in cancellation uh, proceedings, where you do um, need to have these uh, grounds included. So that was all I wanted to add on this slide. And then we can move on to the next slide. And uh, Lenica will talk about the power of attorney requirements. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, a power of attorney is not needed. This only will be the case in, uh, uh, when the office has any concerns. I have to say in 10 years of practice, I have never had that happen. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but I do think it's uh, an indication of how hardly it ever happens. Uh, in case a power of attorney is needed, a simple digital copy will suffice. So no need for let, uh, legalization or notarization. I know that in some countries this is the case and it can uh, provide some headaches to our clients, but you know, this is not the case for the Benelux office. Uh, one thing that we do want to note is that uh, it does need to contain a handwritten signature, so an electronic one will not suffice. So for uh, Romania, um, uh, a power of attorney is needed. Uh, normally it uh, has to be filed uh, together with the opposition. The current implementation regulation of the Romanian trademark law uh, provides for the possibility upon payment an official fee to uh, file the power of attorney uh, within a deadline of two months since filing the opposition. This uh, implementation regulation is expected to be changed soon, so um, we don't know if this provision will be maintained or not. Um, the power of attorney, uh, as you have mentioned also, also for Benelux, uh, does not need legalization or notarization, but it has to be um, uh, to have a handwritten signature. If the opposition is filed via email, then the power of attorney is not filed, of course, in the original, but the office can ask it. So the norm is that the office wants the power of attorney in original. Uh, in Italy, the power of attorney is due um, in two months is filing the opposition. It is very important to have a, a, a date on the power of attorney, which needs to be prior to filing the opposition. Um, failing to file the power of attorney is a ground of inadmissibility of the opposition, which uh, would therefore be dismissed. Of course, if there is a general power of attorney on file, a reference can be made to such within the notice of opposition. In Spain, the power of attorney <clears throat> um, can be filed within one month since filing the opposition or uh, two months if the applicant has no residence in uh, Spain. In uh, Germany, there is no requirement of a power of attorney. In Portugal, uh, power of attorney is requested only for lawyers, for uh, authorized representatives, so industrial property official agents do not need to file a power of attorney. And in France, um, there is no need to file a power of attorney for lawyers and trademark attorneys, but there is um, special requirements in this sense. So there is a need to file a power of, an, uh, of attorney in case the representative is um, a person authorized to represent the party before the office. Um, and that person is on a special list of the office. 
if it's a professional from a um, European Union member state or uh, from the European Union, um, European economic area, uh, who, who is authorized to represent uh, any person before the office of his country or um, a company established in the European economic area contractually linked to the, um, to the party. So these are the um, mentions uh, on the power of attorney from my side. So as regards to um, late payment, so 40% of the opposition fee must be paid in order for the opposition to be admissible. This cannot be remedied. There are only two, uh, there are, there's a list of minimum requirements and there are only two minimum requirements that can be remedied. These are the name of the opponent and in relation to the earlier right invoked, if, it, if you need to prove that it has been renewed or anything, but um, the payment of the opposition fee, unfortunately not. Of course, um, if you have, if there's still time, you can always refile and then actually pay it if you're still within the uh, opposition term. And otherwise, it is always possible to just have the um, application be registered and then file a cancellation action. And this is actually a, a very a great option for us as practitioners because before the new um, before the new directive was implemented, we would have to go to court if we wanted to file cancellation action. So that was often a much more elaborate process with much more cost and it took a lot more time. So it's very great that we can also file a cancellation action if needed. Uh, the other 60% must be paid no later than the actual commencement uh, of proceedings. If not, uh, the boy will provide another month. So this can actually be uh, remedied. If it's not paid, the examination of the opposition will be abandoned. Um, and there is a difference between closure of the proceedings versus the abandonment of the proceed uh, of the abandonment of the proceedings, because in case of the closure, uh, you will get a refund of part of the fees already paid, and in case of abandonment, this will not be the case. So, just a little side note. Yes. So, when um, it will be a very short mention in the, neither in Romania nor in Italy, uh, there is no late uh, payment uh, provided. So, the fees have to be uh, paid uh, once the position is filed. So this is a, from my perspective, this is a very interesting um, uh, aspect ownership and plurality of uh, claimants. Uh, I will make a few mention about Romania, Spain, and Italy. Uh, but I will start uh, with what the European Union trademark system provides, and this is very clear. So within the European Union uh, trademark system, uh, this matter is uh, very clearly provided uh, in the Commission Delegated Regulation 625 from 2018, Article 2. Two, it is provided that uh, in case of co-ownership, uh, one um, or all the proprietors uh, of uh, a trademark or a prior right can file the, the opposition. The EUIPO uh, case law is uh, consistent with this legal provision. Um, however, uh, in Romania, in Romania uh, the Romanian uh, trademark law does not have an express, pro express provision in this uh, sense. Um, however, the um, High Court of Cassation and Justice from Romania has underlined in one of its uh, decisions um, in a um, trademark infringement action that the owner of a trademark can file um, the action uh, without the consent uh, of the other proprietors. So he has an interest because he is the owner, uh, he's also an owner of that trademark and he has an exclusive right and he should benefit of, that, of those rights. In what concerns uh, Spain, um, either this is also very clear, like in the European Union trademark system, either one or um, all the co-owners uh, can file the opposition. While in Italy, the if in case of co-ownership, the power of attorney can be signed only by one of the co-owners, as long as the action is made in the interest of all uh, the others. Thank you, uh, Delia. Um, just to take one, one step back in the Benelux, uh, the first bullet point it, cons it considers indeed when the same uh, owner has, of course, different rights that you can combine in one action. But if you have rights, or your rights, earlier rights of different owners, of course, you cannot invoke it in the same action. Then you need to file multiple actions. So one action per challenged right. And then if you turn to co-ownership, then there is also the co-ownership issue of the earlier or the invoked right on the one hand side, and then of course also on the challenged right side. 
on the uh, earlier ride is, is in line with what you said. All of the co-owners have standing separately because it is indeed a defensive action to protect uh, the earlier ride, the earlier trademark. If you are talking about the challenged ride, then uh, the convention refers back to the laws of either Belgium, the Netherlands or Luxembourg. And then depending on um, the seat of the of the holder, if uh, the holder is from outside of the Benelux, then um, the governing law would be uh, the Dutch law, the law of the Netherlands as a default position. And what can also be interesting to know if, is that licensees, when they are registered, they can also um, act on communication issues. And then we can immediately turn to the next slide about how you communicate with the others. And in the Benelux, it's very much a written procedure. Um, you also have a board communication inbox. You sometimes also get um, letters by regular mail, such as the decision. And you can also um, use regular email in the sense that if you um, file a question uh, through uh, the contact form, you get a reply by email. So it's very much uh, a very uh, practical way of communication, uh, a written procedure in the Benelux. And then I'll hand over again to Delia to talk about ways of communication with other national offices. In uh, Romania, the Romanian uh, IPO communicates with the parties mostly through post, but also in some cases via email. Um, there is uh, also a specific service that the uh, Romanian IPO offers for the um, IP councils, uh, namely to have a file at their registry and uh, where, where all the correspondence can be put there and uh, can be taken upon uh, signature. It's uh, quite uh, efficient um, and I think it's, um, it helps a lot um, with the communication of the um, um, decision and all other procedural acts. In Italy, uh, the office corresponds uh, with the parties through registered email or by certified mail. Um, the former is much more common. Uh, there is also a e-filing of the opposition. In Germany, it's by letter, telephone, or fax. Um, in uh, France, it's through the online platform and by post. And in Portugal, online and paper communication via um, mail services. This was my um, input. We are talking then about communication of all uh, procedure acts um, to the parties by, by the office. And in the Benelux, this is effectively uh, the case. It is the principle of hearing both sides. It is contradictory uh, proceedings and it's highly valued. So even when an action is inadmissible, each relevant document that has been submitted to the office by the one party uh, will be sent to uh, the other party. So in uh, Romania, um, hmm, all the procedural acts are communicated um, in general, but uh, within the opposition uh, procedure, the response of the applicant filed in the opposition is not communicated to the opponent, which in practice uh, raises certain, a lot of issues as the entire file can be seen only in the appeal uh, procedure. So if there are um, exceptions or other um, aspects on uh, merits, um, these are not known in fact to the opponent if raised by the respondent, uh, because this response is not uh, communicated. Uh, in the appeal, maybe this will change with the new regulation, we shall see. In the appeal phase, uh, all the procedural acts are communicated to both parties. Um, in Italy, Germany, France, Portugal, all the procedural acts are communicated to both parties. Uh, the same in Spain, with one exception, um, the reply of the applicant to the provisional opposition uh, is not communicated. So this is only a very short so parenthesis. We are talking about documents and there's a small um, parenthesis about oral proceedings, which are normally not available in first instance proceedings with some exceptions, such as France. They are much more common um, when it comes to appeal in Germany, Italy, Romania, for example. And in all jurisdictions, appeal uh, require the written form and are also replied to in writing. In Italy and in Romania, uh, then the proceeding is similar. After this first exchange, the office will issue a notice with uh, the date of the hearing and um, the Board of Appeal. And the uh, board will take a decision which is uh, uh, 
after the written conclusions in Romania and before the written con conclusions, um, well, actually the other way around. Uh, there are first written conclusions in Romania and then the board will take um, a decision. And uh, in Italy, the written conclusions are sort of a preparation for the, for the hearing. Another difference is that um, in Romania, things remained uh, virtually unchanged uh, with the pandemic. So apart from, of course, the safety precautions that are taken now, um, there are still uh, hearings in person, oral hearings in person. In Italy, on the other hand, uh, oral hearings have been totally suspended. They have not even been uh, replaced by a Zoom or uh, virtual uh, video conferences. So they have been replaced by other written exchanges still. As a whole, it's not surprising, of course, that in the first instance in oppositions, uh, um, are mostly conducted in writing and we are used to this and we will see perhaps when uh, as a consequence of the introduction of administrative uh, invalidity and revocation um, proceedings in all countries, uh, perhaps the uh, hearings, oral hearings at the IPOs will become uh, more common or more popular. And uh, before we go back to the written part of the proceedings, again, I'll give the floor to Karina for uh, some words about uh, the system in the Benelux. Thank you, uh, Mara. Indeed, just to, to add shortly, as I already said, in, in the Benelux, it's very much a written uh, procedure. There is a, although there is a provision that or on request of the parties or ex officio, uh, an oral hearing can take place, but this is really very rarely applied. So um, in that sense, um, the pandemic didn't have uh, consequences on uh, the type of proceedings in, um, in the Benelux. And then we can move on to the next slide. And I think Delia is taking the floor there on requirements concerning the format of the documents to be filed. So in uh, Romania, I mean, it's hard copies uh, to be filed with the office. Electronic form are accepted for the ones um, that are filed uh, via email or fax. In Italy, um, there is a specific requirement for translations. Um, uh, the translation needs to be uh, certified um, for the translation into Italian language. The trademark attorney has the power to certify translation before the Italian IPO. In Germany, there is no online communication, only hard copies and original um, is requested for affidavits. Uh, in Spain and in France, can copies are sufficient. And in Portugal, um, online and paper communication via email uh, services are available. Well, in the Benelux, I think it's important to note that they, um, whenever you have uh, any uh, concerns as to whether you're using the right format, uh, just always check with the Benelux office. These people are amazing. You can always ask the contact service or the lawyers there. So that's the most important thing I wanted to give you that you can, you know, it's, they're very easy. They're, they're very um, willing to think along. One of the things that I also wanted to point out, it is, I didn't actually know this, but in preparation of this webinar, I had to look uh, into the rules very deeply. And uh, it's still possible to file via fax, which was news to me. I don't think anyone really uses it anymore. Um, but what happens if you file via fax and it's not legible for the Benelux office, they will give you the chance to refile if it's still within the deadline. But if you have filed it and they can't read it and the deadline has expired, it will have deemed not to have been submitted. So I would say don't use the facts, but apparently it's still an option. So I just wanted to point that out real quick. Uh, and I think that we can now give the floor to Karina again. Yes, next slide, please. This is about the language of proceedings. And also there, uh, we are quite flexible in the Benelux, uh, not only in administrative proceedings uh, for the Benelux office, but in general, we have to, um, since Dutch is not uh, that well known everywhere, and in the Benelux, we have two official languages for the office, that's French and Dutch. But um, as said, we're practical, um, and also English is allowed as a working language. The system works that when you file in your proceedings, you indicate which is the preferred language um, which you want to use, but the defendant can then um, make another choice and notify you uh, thereof. Uh, if there is no uh, choice uh, by the defendant, then um, the rule goes that it's the language of the classification of the challenged uh, mark. And then uh, if these are in English, then it's a language choice again of the claimant. Uh, 
Um, but also evidence can be submitted in the original uh, language if it's sufficiently understood. So the message is uh, that it is um, really a, a flexible and pragmatic system also from a language point of view. Not really. I mean, in, in Italy, we only have one official language, of course. And uh, as we will also mention later on, uh, the requirement that every, everything is in Italian is rather strict. And uh, as uh, Delia also uh, men mentioned, uh, um, we need to have this sort of certification of the, of the translations, which, however, can be done by a trademark attorney. We do not need an official translator for this. I think we can go on to the next chapter then on procedural aspects. Can we have the next slide? Yes. And then the next slide uh, talks about the consequence of absence of a reply, and uh, Mara will uh, take the floor there. Yes, so generally speaking, there is no uh, presumed abandonment when the applicant does not reply to an opposition. There is no obligation on the applicant to uh, reply in opposition. And uh, well, this is a case, for example, Italy, Ireland, Gen uh, Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, and Romania, among others. This is, let's say, a standard for us Europeans, but it should point it out be pointed out if we are, for example, as assisting some owner from the US or the UK, because in those jurisdictions, uh, failing to reply uh, does imply a lack, lack of interest and does eventually lead to abandonment. So it's something we should uh, keep in mind. Uh, on the other hand, um, failure to reply will lead, in most cases, the IPO to take a decision on the basis of the arguments of one party alone, which is the opponent. What is the uh, what do we mean with the Italian uh, Italian exception? So, uh, in the case of national applications, uh, things go just as I described. the The applicant does not need to uh, reply to the opposition, and uh, the office will take a decision. But in the case of an international registration, the point is that when the office issues the provisional refusal, it does not also uh, simultaneously serve the opposition itself to the owner of the international mark. So only if the owner of the international registration explicitly requires a copy through a local representative, the proceeding will start. Otherwise, uh, the office will simply issue a final refusal and uh, that's it. So in this sense, uh, uh, one must be careful um, when uh, an opposition is filed against the Italian designation of an international registration. And on the other hand, uh, uh, we sometimes advise the opponents to file an opposition, even if chances are not so brilliant, let's say, because statistically it does happen that the other party is not aware or anyway does not ask for this copy and uh, the case is dismissed and the trademark is refused finally. So in, in the Benelux we have two situations that we, um, we can have. You can have a failure to respond to a regularization in case of you need to be able to have a correspondence uh, address within the EU or uh, you have to have a designated representative um, if uh, you do not respond to that, um, uh, the opposition proceedings will be closed and you will have deemed to have renounced your uh, application. Uh, when it comes to failure to taking any action, this is actually uh, a fun one um, from 2006 to 2011, the Benelux office was very strict. So any time of action, any kind of action you would take, even if it was purely procedural, for example, you know, having a reaction in relation to the language of the proceedings, they would say, well, you have taken action and they would actually proceed. Um, we've taken a final decision. Um, they got a lot of feedback from users saying that that was not very practical. So they changed it in 2011 and now um, there will need to be some sort of substantial action. So if you have only asked for you know, if you've only responded to the language of the proceedings or only have asked for proof of use, but have not actually have given any substantial material reaction, 
um, then they will say that you have not taken any action. So in case that any action was taken, so meaning any substantial action, a final decision will be uh, given. And in case no action was taken, so only in relation to, uh, so none at all, or only in relation to procedural rules, the opposition will be closed and you will, and the applicant of the trademark application will have deemed to renounce its rights for said application. Use uh, defense. Uh, um which also has in oppositions which also has its corresponding provisions in uh, for invalidity proceedings now the conditions for this defense are clearly set out in the directive itself transposition of this uh, provision is new for some countries for a number of countries actually for so spain and portugal among others the directive does not go more in detail so the, qu the question is when uh, are we allowed to um, to request uh, this proof of use and how meaning um, by not only by what deadline and but what else should we do by the same deadline so in the majority of jurisdictions a request of proof of use must be advanced uh, uh, by the first reply deadline then there are some exceptions the first exception i mentioned is greece um, when uh, where it can be advanced at any time during the examination of the opposition in some jurisdictions in many jurisdictions actually the practice is similar to the one at the I, uh, uipo we are used to so it is possible to limit the very first reply to simply a request for proof of use and then file the substantive brief later on once we had a chance to actually examine this uh, proof of use in italy the office is uh, actually very formal so uh, we need to file a full uh, argumentative brief by the same deadline as the request of proof of use even if there is like only one mark uh, which is um, vulnerable to use requirement, uh, we still need to file our brief. I go back to the directive uh, for a moment because according to the directive, the proof of use can be requested if at the time of filing or the priority date of the opposed application, the mark or the marks uh, on which the opposition is based were registered for five or more years. And this is, in fact, uh, the rule that is applied in um, many countries, almost all countries. But there are um, a few countries, and among them Germany, where the um, practice is different. And one should be aware, both if uh, we are the opponent and if we are the applicant, because actually the proof of use can be requested even if the five years grace period expires during the proceedings. So even if the mark at the basis of the opposition was not a subject to use requirement at the time of filing or the priority date of the opposed application, but it becomes um, vulnerable to use requirement later, then the party, uh, the applicant can request a proof of use. And um, this is actually different from most other jurisdictions, so it should be kept in mind. I also add that again in Germany, if uh, the um, objection, I mean, the request of proof of use is not admissible because it is raised before the expiry of the grace period, it does not become automatically admissible later when the five years period uh, passes. Uh, it must be um, requested uh, again. The, uh, the request must be raised uh, separately again. Um, well, one of the things that I wanted to touch upon is that um, in a Benelux, up until recently, it's also set in the procedural rules that a request for, uh, for proof of use had to be explicit. So you actually it didn't mean it didn't matter in which format you do it. You can you can do it with within the substantive um, response. You can also do it, you know, uh, as a first as a first response saying we want a proof of use and then later reply on set proof of use together with the substantive response. But the request had to be explicit. So you actually had to say, we request proof of use for the for those marks invoked that are subject to the requirement of genuine use. And in the beginning of this year, the Benelux Court of Justice, which is now the appellate court for um, these types of cases, they actually kind of, I, I said softened, I don't think that's the proper term, but kind of softened this requirement, kind of, say, kind of saying that more implicit requests will also have to be accepted, because in the case at hand, um, the defendant actually didn't request proof of use explicitly. It just said, yes, but these are trademarks that are subject to the uh, requirement of genuine use. So they did definitely refer to it, but didn't explicitly request proof of use. 
Um, so this um, this is a pretty major change, both for the uh, for the office itself and also for its users. So I'm very um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to happen and and how it's going to happen because that's definitely an interesting thing. And also something that I wanted to uh, point out is that of course at the EU IPO they're very strict. It needs to be a request for uh, proof of use actually needs to be done via a separate document. And the grant board actually said that it's very strict. So even if um, it's placed within, I think what happened in the case at hand was that um, the request for proof of use was title one and then the other part in title two, but it was placed on the same page. So the grant board said, no, that's not a separate document. So we don't have anything like that in the Benelux. The office is very relaxed in this respect. You just have to put it in somewhere and they will respond to it. So acceptance of proof of use is a uh rather uh, jurisdiction specific in that it changes from one jurisdiction to another. Again, I must mention that in Italy, um, examination is very formal. And there is an issue that I would call of a, like a global assessment problem in the sense that the office tends to look at each piece of evidence separately, will not cross information and documents, not even when it is uh, prompted by, by the party who is filing these documents. Um, partly unrelated to this problem, but important. So I mention it in Italy, fresh evidence of use before the Board of Appeal cannot be filed, is not accepted not even if it is meant to complement documents that were filed earlier. Now, the good news is that other offices are much more flexible and that some offices have issued guidelines uh, on how evidence should be organized, for example, in Spain and France. And I particularly mentioned France, if you have uh, experience that dates back to before the transposition uh, of the directive, uh, bear in mind that the change is rather significant because the previous practice was very relaxed. And now we should instead pay great attention to the new formalism that was introduced uh, with the transposition and special requirements, even on the numbering of, present, of the pages and how documents should be um, presented in support to the opposition. And uh, as a whole in France, let's say that the evidentiary bar is now let's say much higher than, uh, uh, than it was before the, the implementation of the directive. In Romania, the office is uh, open, let's say, in the sense that they do not often object to the means of evidence. But as uh, Delia mentioned before about translations, all the evidence um, should be translated. Another good news is that in most uh, countries do require translations, but only on main parts. And again, the two extremes, so let's say, are represented by Germany, where there usually is no need for translation unless it is requested by the office. And Italy on the other side, I already mentioned this, where virtually every element uh, requires translation, even parts that are totally self-evident, like invoices or extracts from uh, magazines. I understand there are some fun facts about um, evidence in the Benelux that uh, Karina or Lenik is willing to share. Uh, yeah, well, the f I mean, to me, it's a fun fact. I get the fact that for some people, this wouldn't qualify as fun. But, you know, I consider myself to be somewhat of an IPOholic. So I, I love this kind of stuff. Uh, it was actually a decision of the Benelux office that gave rise to the ECJ's Leno Merken Hagelkhuis. And as this is a horrible Dutch saying, um, you will probably know the case as Onel Omel, uh, in which the court was asked to uh, provide some further insight as to whether use in only one member state would qualify, uh, will qualify to as genuine use within uh, the European community. And um, well, the Benelux uh, office was of the opinion that it wasn't. It said, you know, the fact that the joint statements back then said like, yes, use in one member state will suffice. And they said, well, you know, um, we are in the opinion that the view expressed in the joint statements that genuine use in one country is by definition genuine use in the community cannot be upheld. And one of the things that we see happen is that the Benelux office, they still do this. They very much look at the nature of the goods or services for which uh, the trademark has been registered. Uh, so, yeah, and now we, of course, know that uh, that the uh, um, that the ECJ has said that it's actually, they, they kind of followed the Benelux uh, 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 interpretation. So I think that the Benelux office was happy about that. I'm not sure about all of the users, but um, that, that's a different story. Um, I think one of the main things uh, 
the means of proving you can use pretty much anything the Benelux office does specifically state in its guidelines that they prefer uh, documents like just paper documents or you know they can be filed digitally but um, but it's also possible to file by other means so uh, DVDs or CD-ROMs again if you have any if there are any concerns as to whether this will be accepted you can simply call the office and ask them if it will be done. And I think um, there are two other points I wanted to point out. If a forwarding proof of use exceeds the cost of 25 euros, they will have to be borne by the opponent. And um, documents serving to support arguments or to prove the use of a trademark may be submitted in their original language, but they will only be understood if the office can actually if the office believes that they can be sufficiently understood. So in the case that, you know, if you ever have any proof and you are hesitant, I would definitely say just um, be on the safe side and, and file um, translations just to make sure. But that's just, uh, that's just a little tip I, I was thinking about giving. And this is about the conflict, of course, to pending court claims, um, which has now been introduced since cancellation actions can also be filed before the office. And from a Benelux uh, perspective, the court claims or the court cases have priority over the administrative proceedings, and you can also have an ex officio suspension of these uh, administrative proceedings. So the court takes uh, priority in the Benelux, but it may be different for uh, the other jurisdictions. And I give the floor to Delia to add uh, from uh, the perspective of other uh, jurisdictions. Romania and uh, Italy, uh, suspension um, of um, the opposition proceeding um can be uh, granted in romania ex officio or at the request of the party and in italy at the request of one party if uh, there are pending actions regarding the validity of the rights or a pending uh, trademark application was um, used as basis of the opposition until the finalization of the registration procedure of that uh, trademark use as a um, basis in the opposition procedure in romania and italy there is no voluntary suspension um, however, however, in Spain and France, um, a suspension can be requested jointly uh, by both parties. And in Portugal, suspension of the proceedings for a period of six months is uh, available. So yes, in the Benelux, suspension are possible only at joint request. Uh, these are given uh, for four months each time. It can be repeatedly indefinitely, so there's no number uh, to the uh, no limit to the number of suspensions. So if you were to want, you could, you know, file 30 suspensions. I don't know why you would want that, but you know, just in case, it is a possibility. The first three requests are actually uh, uh, free of charge, so no fees are uh, are asked by the Benelux office. For the fourth quest and beyond, there will be fees um, uh, of 150 euros, which will be um, uh, shared by both opponent and applicant. And one thing that's important to note that either party can still opt out at any given moment. I think uh, I recently had a talk with someone in the Benelux and they were like, no, we don't have that option. And I think one of the reasons like with the EU IPO, of course, when you extend the cooling off, it's for 22 months at once. So that's a long period of time. So then it makes sense for people that you can opt out at any moment. And I think this person felt like it's only four months, so why should we be able to opt out? But it's definitely an option. So I wanted to touch upon that very briefly because I think it's important to know. This is a very, very short uh, mention of extension of terms, uh, meaning a unilateral extension of terms, which are not uh, um, available in France, Italy, Romania, in Spain only in um, in a few cases that I will mention, they are available in Germany. In Spain, I, I would like to simultaneously mention that uh, generally speaking, the deadlines are very short. You only have one month to reply to the position, one month to submit the proof of use, and that one single extension, a 15 days extension, because it's calculated like half the normal uh, deadline is uh, provided for, but only if the party is not a domicile in Spain. So um, everything is very, is very quick. Um, apart from that, I will give the floor to Lenica again for the Benelux practice on this. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's actually very short. Uh, we just uh, talked about suspension a little bit and a unilateral extension of terms is not possible, which is something we do have to point out to people because of course with the EU IPO, you can always for the first round, you can have the two months extension. 
unilaterally, that's not possible in the Benelux. So that's what I wanted to say about this. And I think I'm going back to you, Mara. Yes, I think we can um, move on to the next uh, slide and the next. So we are in a new section, <laughs> grounds, uh, uh, legal grounds for an opposition. So, um, well, establishing that uh, marks with the reputation and the DOPs and IGs could be grounds for opposition, uh, meaning so this, the second and the third um, ground that you read on the slide was, uh, I believe, one of the main objectives of the recast directive. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the relevant provisions are new in many countries, including Italy. Um, just as Incidentally, um, I recommend avoiding the practice of just indicating all possible grounds in our opposition form, even if they're not relevant, because it's not nice to have an office, you know, declare that some of the grounds are really unfounded. Um, so these are the grounds that are now common to all member states, but there still uh, exist some grounds that are uh, specific. There are optional grounds provided for by the directive itself, which uses the wording and in particular, and then lists. Um, the most common is uh, and most relevant, I believe, is uh, our non-registered uh, uh, marks, uh, other than those in, in the meaning of the six uh, bits of the Paris Convention. And uh, non-registered marks are a ground for opposition in Germany along um, with other signs such as company names and titles of books or films, but they are not uh, grounds for oppositions, for example, in France, Spain, Romania, Italy. It, these countries do have their own uh, specific grounds. For example, uh, in France, we have uh, company names and even domain names. Uh, in Spain, um, copyrights and design rights. Uh, Romania implemented one specific provision of the directive, uh, which uh, combines bad faith under the condition that the same mark was uh, registered uh, abroad by the opponent. Uh, in Italy, again, as I said, we do not have uh, unregistered marks as a uh, ground for opposition. Uh, we do have uh, um, a provision that I believe, I am not totally sure, but I believe that is uh, rather unique um, of Italy. So signs used in arts, uh, sports, uh, images of trophies, names of sports associations. So um, signs that are um, well known, but not in business, not specifically uh, in business. Now, so, um, some part of this we was already in our law. Others were added, not so much uh, in relation to the directive, actually, uh, but I still um, mention this. They were added uh, uh, with the aim to protect large sporting events like uh, the Olympic Games and the World uh, uh, Soccer Cup, for example. Um, so I think that's uh, it. And I can give the floor to Karina with, for an overview of the Benelux law. And in this respect. And on the next slide, you can see the legal grounds not only for opposition in the Benelux, but also for cancellation actions and uh, revocation actions. Uh, for opposition, it's a double identity, likelihood of confusion, well-known marks that already existed uh, previously. Now we also have now reputation um, filing by an agent or a representative without authorization and on the basis of a PDO PGI. So those are the opposition grounds. And then we have the grounds for cancellation, which are either the absolute uh, grounds or the relative grounds. And um, if it comes to the relevant grounds, they are uh, the same as the opposition grounds. And finally, you have the revocation for possible lack of uh, general use, uh, generic terms or misleading terms. So those are all the grounds uh, you can invoke in the Benelux in the different type of actions. And then we can move on to the next slide. And there we were discussing uh, among the panel, what is the weight of EUI pro case law given um, by the national offices. And um, in the Benelux, it is one factor, it's one element that will be taken into account, just as the other arguments and, and, and elements that are uh, advanced by the parties in the proceedings 
but it is very clear that um, the office is not bound by precedent nor by its own uh, precedent or by decisions uh, of the EU IPO. So it is uh, a factor, an element, but it is not a decisive factor. And then Delia will add for Romania and Italy. The situation in Romania is more or less as uh, you expose it uh, for the Benelux. The UIPO um, practice and case law is considered by the office. Uh, of course, is invoked in most of the opposition responses. And it's invoked in the procedure also by the office, but it's not a decisive uh, factor. The office will take into consideration the specificity of each case and will take a decision based on the evidence submitted in that file. So it is considered, but it's not uh, decisive. Um, as for uh, Italy, I will leave Mara to uh, give uh, an input. Yes, well, generally speaking, um, in Italy, it is like uh, the Benelux and uh, uh, Romania. So the decisions, the Italian decisions do mention the UIP case law, while at the same time repeatedly stating that the national decisions are autonomous and they are not bound by the UIPO, etc. Um, my personal impression is that this is due partly due to the fact that the same professionals that means us uh, mention a lot of UIPO case law in their arguments, which is understandable because there is so much uh, case law available. It's so much easier to to refer to the UIPO case law. Um, but there are some differences. We can go to the next slide now. In Italy, for example, there is uh, there are differences when it comes to the weight of distinctive character of the mark, and this difference can have a, a bearing on the outcome of the opposition. Maybe important. So assessing the distinctive character of the earlier mark is very important in Italy, and uh, um, it is uh, preliminary to the rest of the assessment. So it's not just one of the factors, it's a, a preliminary factor that then will condition the subsequent factors. So for example, uh, if in the circumstance that an earlier mark uh, is not very distinctive, uh, this circumstance will have more bearing on a decision in Italy rather than a decision at the EU IPO level. I understand from um, uh, people we, who we have interviewed from other jurisdictions in preparing this uh, webinar that this is not the case, for example, in Germany, in Spain, in Romania, the, the approach is much more similar. Uh, to the one of the EU IPO, uh, but in Benelux the practice is perhaps even more complex, so the floor goes back to Karina for this, uh, who will elaborate more in detail. I don't know if it's, it's, if it's more complex, it's uh, one of the, of the factors, again, uh, in the assessment, the global assessment of, of likelihood of confusion. So the higher the distinctiveness, uh, the greater the chance that you have a finding of likelihood of confusion. But that doesn't mean that when you have a weak distinctive character, um, that it would immediately preclude the likelihood of confusion to be found. Within the Benelux practice, it's very much the principle of interdependency that is uh, applied. What is important, though, is that reputation, reputation is not a ground for already presuming uh, there is a likelihood um, of confusion also in the Benelux. Then Lenica was to add uh, on the test for descriptiveness specifically, so we can go to the next slide. Yes, well, I think this is not of as much much relevance within oppositions because, of course, in an opposition in the Benelux, it will also be that invoked rights are presumed valid, so you cannot actually say that they're not valid. Uh, but for cancellation in particular, I think this one is a really big one. Um, of course, the um, the uh, legislation states that any trademark that could serve uh, as an as a description uh, of the goods and services will be deemed descriptive. Um, and the EU IPO uh, usually uh, actually uses the, the, the test that it needs to be a link that's immediately and without further reflection. Um, in a Benelux, we have a little bit of a difference of looking at that. So the Benelux Court of Justice actually said that could serve should be read as could refer which is of course much broader because um, could refer is a little bit more uh, least, is a little bit more open. Uh, this is also actually specifically stated in the guidelines of the uh, Benelux office. It says it follows that it's not ne necessary for the relevant public to perceive immediately and without further reflection a description of one of the characteristics of those goods or services. Such marks are also descriptive, of course, but the character 
that the category of descriptive marks is broader than marks which do so in that way. Um, I have to be honest, I haven't in practice haven't seen much of a difference yet, but I do think that this will at a certain point become a thing and I'm sure that there will be a lot, a lot more case law about it. Uh, but yeah, that's definitely uh, just what I wanted to point out. So I think that's important and also of course, uh, when you file a cancellation, I think that's just, this is pretty self-evident, but just to make sure, uh, in the first decision on cancellation, it was the sign pure drought. And then the applicant for cancellation said, well, yes, it is here. It's, it's, a, it's a term that can be found in the English dictionary. And then the Benelux office said, well, that's great, but you do have to uh, prove that it's actually in relation to the relevant public. So simply stating that it's within the dictionary will not suffice. Uh, it was the first uh, decision, so I just wanted to point that out real quick. So um, this slide is not so much a, a statement on how things are, but rather on how things could be. It's meant to be an encouragement to professionals to um, think out of the box when it comes to uh, goods and services, not always simply rely on the UIPO similarity tool and uh, uh, apart from general comments that one could have, and I personally would have on the on the tool itself, um, it is important to consider that there could be, and in fact, uh, I believe there are, really are differences based on national specialty products. Um, if we remain in the food field, for example, I'm sure that in some countries, attention for beer is higher than in others, or you know, cheese or wine. And, and this has an implication on the relevant ability of the consumers to distinguish one mark from another on their average uh, level of attention. So there are certainly arguments to be made um, and in order to bring uh, decisions in this respect to be sort of less mechanical, have a less mechanical approach. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, the IPOs are eager to show their autonomy. So somehow, maybe this is an occasion that we can offer uh, the offices to put in practice their autonomy uh, with respect to the IPO. And um, I think we're changing subject now, Lenike. Yes, bad faith in the banner look. So it's a new ground for, uh, well, I say opposition, but it's actually the agent's trademark for the ground of opposition. But I always feel like that's a like a species of bad faith. That's why I put it in like this. And it's also a ground for cancellation. And this was very much against the wishes of the Benelux office. Um, and the lawyers at the Benelux office, um, they say, you know, because it's rather factual, it's also very factual rather than only legal. And they felt like they were maybe not very, very well equipped for it. I totally disagree. I think they can do anything they want and they can definitely do it. But I do get, it's a very different way of looking at things. Uh, there have been some um, uh, decisions regarding bad faith now, so that's giving a little bit of an indication as to, you know, what is what does it play there, what you need to prove, how you need to prove it, what you what you do and don't need to do. Uh, any review can be suspended when a court claim is also pending. Uh, the Benelux office may suspend it, so it's it's their discretionary. Uh, um, so they, they can decide it for themselves. And if it's not claimed within the opposition, so again, that's the agent's trademark, you can actually invoke bad faith within the cancellation. So, you know, if you've missed uh, the opposition, there's always uh, the cancellation that, uh, that can uh, help. Yes, because I think that when it comes to public policy and morality, what, I've, what I'm noticing is that, uh, well, I mean, I'm Dutch, and for me, uh, when I look at rulings from the EUIPO, I always think they're very strict, but that's probably because I'm in the Benelux. And as the Benelux office also says, we do not believe that the Benelux office, uh, Benelux public is easily offended. So in order for any uh, trademark registration to be, or trademark application to be, to be refused or an registration to be canceled. I want to say it's are like the very bad cases. So one of the examples we have, and of course it, it's actually a horrible example, there was the word for Joden, which is Dutch for Jews, and it was applied for for showers. So the Benelux office says, well, obviously that brings into mind World War II. This is not appropriate. It needs to be refused. The same thing happened with a gnome. So like a little garden gnome that actually did the Heil Hitler uh, greeting. So they said, yeah, no, that's, that's not acceptable at all. Um, one of the things that is very uh, funny for me to see, I mean, I live in Amsterdam. So, you know, for me, any relation to marijuana isn't really that big of a deal. 
uh, but we do see that at the EU IPO and the Board of Appeal has recently uh, given some uh, decision on the fact, and of course the general court in the Bavaria wheat case, the, the feeling I get is that any uh, trademark containing any possible um, relation to marijuana could be found to be promoting use of a legal substance and therefore will be deemed against public policy and morality. In the Benelux, we don't really have that feeling at all. So I, I included the Dutch wheat burger. I probably included that because I'm a vegan. So I love eating the Dutch uh, wheat burger. By the way, it is a another um, word mark. It's actually a word device mark because otherwise you might think, find it destructive. Um, but wheat burger, it, it's a burger made of seaweed. So even if you could believe that wheat was uh, referring to marijuana, it isn't. Uh, but yeah, it was accepted without a problem. But with, with the Bavaria wheat, the general court said, yeah, it, it could be seen as promoting use of an illegal substance. So it needs to be refused. So I feel like, um, so there are two things, like we are a little bit easier anyway in the Benelux. And then when it comes to anything relating to wheat or marijuana, we are definitely much more easy. In uh, what concerns Romania, uh, bad faith um, cannot be um, raised uh, as a ground uh, during the opposition proceeding or appeal. It's a ground uh, which can be raised only uh, during the cancellation actions. Uh, the only time that bad faith uh, comes uh, into discussion in front of the Romanian Trademark Office is the situation that uh, Mara has exposed. Uh, that is a relative ground. Namely, a trademark can be refused at registration or can be cancelled if it uh, registered, if it can be confused with the trademark registered abroad, if the applicant uh, has filed uh, the, that trademark in bad faith. So this is a ground that can be raised only during the cancellation actions. In, that, in what concerns the policy um, uh, and morality, uh, this is an absolute ground. Uh, it can be raised during observations, but also um, the examined ex officio by the office, uh, as it is an absolute ground. Uh, it can be uh, also a cancellation ground uh, in a cancellation action. As an example of a trademark that was rejected by the Romanian trademark office based on uh, public policy and morality was the puta madre a file for goods in classes uh, 25 and services in class 30 uh, 35 so 25 and 35 and um, um, the office has considered the board of appeal has considered that uh, this comes from spanish language the spanish language is a latin language as it is the romanian language so it will be uh, understood by the by a romanian consumer uh, and considering what it means, it is contrary to um, public policy and morality. So this trademark was rejected at registration. This is my uh, input uh, for um, Romania. Uh, we can go uh, on the next slide on the decision on costs. Uh, the issue on the decision uh, on costs is uh, very diff different from country to country. While in some jurisdictions it is possible to uh, recover um, uh, costs, in other it is not possible, and in other it is possible only to recover uh, official fees, either in whole or in part. In the Benelux, it is possible to recover the cost, but limited to 1,045 euros. In Croatia, Cyprus, Hungary, uh, Ireland, uh, Italy, Lithuania, Poland, uh, it's possible. In Poland, limited. Also in Italy, it is limited. Uh, Mara has underlined to me that um, in, for, in front of the Board of Appeal, the um, a threshold is of uh, 2,000 to 3,000 euro, while the opposition procedure is uh, 300 euros for uh, professional fees and 250 for official fees. In the jurisdiction for where I'm coming from, Romania, it is not possible to recover costs in the opposition procedure. Um, the same is in Austria, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Estonia, in Germany, with some exception, France and other, several other jurisdictions. Um, and in jurisdiction like in Latvia, Greece and Estonia, it is possible to um, obtain uh, some of the official fees uh, or either in full or in uh, part. Um, this was my input on decision uh, on cost. We can go on the next slide, please. If I, if I can add, uh, Didia, just uh, for the for the benefits, because indeed it was mentioned a recovery of opposition costs, but of course in cancellation actions, 
um, the same principle um, is valid that the losing party indeed is ordered uh, to pay the costs, and then uh, it equals the the basic fee, as was mentioned on the on the previous slide for the opposition proceedings, which is one thousand forty five euros. In cancellation actions, it's one thousand four hundred and twenty uh, euros, and this cost decision is also an enforceable order, uh, but there will be no cost award if uh, the action is only uh, partially successful. So that is what I wanted to add and clarify for, for the Benelux on the on the cost decision. The issue of filing an appeal in what concerns the deadlines uh, differs uh, significantly among the countries. It uh, ranges between 15 days in Malta to six months in Lithuania. In Romania, the um, uh, deadline to file an appeal is 30 days, um, which is calculated since the communication date of uh, the decision, uh, which makes the um, object of the appeal. Uh, the same uh, deadline of 30 days exists also in Hungary and Slovakia. In uh, Italy, uh, the deadline to file the appeal is of uh, 60 days. Uh, there is a particularity uh, that uh, Mara has mentioned to me in what concerns the appeal in uh, Italy namely that the appeal needs to be notified by a judicial officer. In Romania, the appeal is uh, filed uh, with the registry of the Romanian Trademark Office or via email, so there is no need for this uh, specific procedure. There are also some particularities in uh, what concerns the deadline for filing an appeal in some countries, like in uh, Spain, it's one month for appeal with the local office and two months to the administrative court. In France, it depends, um, the deadline is uh, one, two or three months, and it depends uh, uh, mostly where the uh, appellant is living. So uh, one month from the notification of the decision, two months if the appellant is living in French overseas departments and territories, and three months if the appellant is living abroad. In uh, Poland, there is also uh, distinctions. It's two months for a uh, motion for reconsideration to the local office or 30 days for complaint to the administrative court. While in Slovenia, there is no appeal possible, but uh, administrative action within uh, 30 days. Yes, it's not so much about the deadline for filing an appeal, uh, which is indeed uh, two months from the notification of the decision, but the appeals are now heard before the Benelux Court of Justice, before the Second Chamber, because we had in the past some discrepancies between um, the Court of Appeal in the Netherlands and uh, in Belgium, and so this will now be aligned because the appeals go directly before the Benelux Court of Justice, the Second Chamber, and then a further appeal is also uh, possible for the uh, First uh, Chamber. That is. Uh, what I uh, wanted to add, and then I give the floor to Mara. We can go to the next slide, please. Apparently, there are no statistics on how many opposition decisions are confirmed and how many are overruled in the single jurisdictions. Uh, the professionals who were interviewed uh, do have however have a, a sense that for example in Italy once the Court of Appeal um, establishes a principle then the opposition division will follow so it will be consistent uh, that in Spain many uh, oppositions have been overruled uh, up to now but the quality is improving so things might uh, change Whereas in France, uh, generally, one has a sense that uh, uh, the decisions between the opposition division and the appeal division are consistent. In Germany, um, again, uh, the situation is slightly different because the consistency depends on the body with which the appeal is filed. So uh, if the appeal is filed uh, with the Board of Appeals at the IPO, then generally, um, the board will tend to agree with the opposition division. And uh, if the appeal is filed with the federal patent court, uh, more often uh, this will uh, this body will reach a different um, decision and uh, overturn the opposition uh, decision. So <clears throat> why do we care? Why should we care about this? Well, we want to know from the start whether we need to assess the chances of success once or twice. If there are cases where we should tell the trademark owner, look, you do not have so many chances of success in opposition, but uh, you can then find a, uh, file an appeal and then uh, your chances will be much higher, for example. So um, we, we, it's important that we consider also what happens at an appeal level and not only in the first instance. And uh, I think Lenike will add something specific for the Benelux. 
Well, I think what's, uh, I think already maybe briefly touch upon it, but uh, maybe not. Uh, we now have, as uh, Karina just said, the Benelux Court of Justice, um, which is the appellate court. This has been the case in 2019. And before that, it would actually be depending on where you were established. So you would either go to the court in, of The Hague, the court of Brussels, or the court in Luxembourg. And what we ex, uh, what we saw happen a lot was, especially between uh, when it was uh, when it came down. Well, this was mostly in relation to refusals, but we did see uh, that the court in Brussels took a very different approach to the court in the Netherlands. I think because they are much more pure when it comes to language in in Belgium than we are in the Netherlands. But uh, because we saw. Um, it was very clear that uh, the decisions between the courts were quite different in this respect. So this was why it was found that there was a need for one appellate court for the entirety of the Benelux. And of course, the judges within that court are uh, representing uh, uh, the three member states. So that's uh, definitely something. Um, I have to say there have been quite a number of um, decisions from the Benelux court, as I already briefly touched upon the Pets budget case, in which they take, um, in which they uh, seem to assume that the test for descriptiveness is much broader than, uh, for example, at the EU IPO. Um, and yeah, and I do think that because um, it's rather, uh, it's, it's relatively new, it's a little bit more difficult to see how they are going to act. So it's definitely also like a double assessment of chances of success, I would definitely say that. And a thing that is possible, uh, for example, because I think Mara, you said it uh, somewhere earlier uh, when it came to proof of use, it is possible to uh, file extra additional proof of use if you have filed it in the opposition proceedings. This has been a long standing practice with the Benelux Court of Justice. So it does give you an opportunity to be more elaborate on your, uh, on your grounds and your evidence. So I think that's definitely something to take into consideration as well. The slide actually, so this is our last question. Uh, it's a question that not, does not have an answer yet. Um, as you are aware, the deadline for bringing into force administrative proceedings for revocation and invalidity of marks is uh, January 2023. So in some countries, these IPO administrative proceedings do not even exist yet. Some cases, for example, in Italy, they are in the law but they are not in force. And uh, the same um, in Romania, I'm not sure if whether they are in the law, but they are not in force yet. So as a whole, the relationship between, for example, administrative proceedings and judicial proceedings or between oppositions and invalidity actions based on the same grounds is uh, not overall clear, uh, certainly not uh, harmonized. Actually, um, this topic would probably deserve an entire webinar for itself, uh, which perhaps in a couple of years, the UIPO will want to uh, organize when it's a time. Uh, but the reason why we nevertheless thought it would be interesting to mention this point, it's because it is sort of an occasion to go back to the beginning of the seminar and close, close a circle. And uh, by this, uh, I mean that uh, it is again, one of the important points to consider. Uh, so those of you who were here earlier this morning recall that we had uh, checklists and then we just talked about chances of success. And uh, so now I add that uh, we should also consider what happens in our worst case scenario, losing an opposition and the appeal. So do I still have other means, other actions that I can take based on the same rights that I am evoking right now? Um, so this is where I, I, I leave you with this. I, I give the, the floor to Lenneke for the last time, I think, and um, before we close. Yes, thank you. Well, I just wanted to point out that I know that within the EU, uh, the Union Mark Regulation, there is actually, for example, Article 60, Paragraph 4, in which there is some um, rule about applying for multiple, uh, you know, having... Uh, multiple actions uh, for the same parties against the same rights. We don't actually have any kind of stipulation like that in the Benelux Convention. Um, so it seems that up until now, pretty much anything is possible. So yeah, you can file an uh, a cancellation action if the opposition is unsuccessful, by all means, we, we think it's possible. Uh, I do wonder if the chances would be any better, but you know, it, it might be. Uh, if you were not able to gather enough evidence of use or anything. Um, so yeah, as far as we know, you can you can do a lot. And um, 
I think it will come down to like the uh, common law to find if it like an abuse of power, if you continue to uh, file cancellation actions against the same trademark or anything like that. But uh, yeah, as Mara says, it's very, uh, it's very interesting to see what's going to happen and what uh, developments will be there. So yeah, I think that was it for me as well. Thank you, Lanika. 